This is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, innovation in the legal industry, and the impact tech is having on the law. I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Percipient, and on today's show, I'm talking to Tanya Evans about her new book, Digital Money Demystified. We also talk about the importance and impact blockchain tech and cryptocurrency will have on the law and how it can help level the economic playing field for all. On this podcast, I talk to a bunch of busy people, and this episode is no different. It's a conversation with Tanya Evans, who's a professor of law at Penn State's Dickinson Law School. We talk about her new book, Digital Money Demystified. Professor Evans has pretty much held every job in legal, from federal judicial clerk to big law lawyer and now legal educator. Not only is Professor Evans a professor and author, she's also a podcaster. She hosts the Tech Intersect podcast, which focuses on Web3 and how it's going to impact the future of work, wealth, and creativity. So the fact that Professor Evans went into law is probably always in the cards. Her mother's a patent attorney, but her father went to med school. At first, Tanya aspired to follow in her father's footsteps and get into medicine. But she changed her mind after discovering sports and figured out she's a problem solver. Before she was a lawyer, Professor Evans played professional tennis for four years after graduating from Northwestern. She was on a tennis scholarship there. In fact, in 93, she made it to the qualifying rounds of the U.S. Open. So why did I want to get Professor Evans on the show? Well, if you've listened to more than a couple episodes... You know that I'm a big blockchain believer, and I think it's really important for people to become more educated about the technology. I think this is especially true for those in legal because I firmly believe blockchain is going to change the way we facilitate and evidence legal relationships and ownership of assets. Professor Evans' book, Digital Money Demystified, is an excellent starting point for anyone curious about learning more about cryptocurrencies. The thing I really liked about the book is it spends a good amount of time debunking a lot of BS out there about blockchain and crypto. Speaking of crypto and education, Tanya is also going to tell us about the Advantage Evans Academy, which is a platform she created that offers learning opportunities about the digital economy. So enough of me. Let's get to my conversation with Professor Tanya Evans. It's interesting because my mother is a retired patent attorney. And when I was just a wee bit of a child, my mom was at Temple Law School. My dad went to Jefferson Medical School in Philadelphia. My mom was literally in law school at the time. I remember taking my nap time in the Black Law Students Association office, balsa, and eating potato chips and watching. I don't remember this part, but my aunts and everyone else tells me about the the fact that I have a little blanket and a black and white TV with some rabbit ears and potato chips, and I was the best kid on the block. And it certainly had an influence on the direction. I think I was actually slated to be a doctor and didn't do (laughs) too well in chemistry. And then the, the writing was on the wall. Uh, I was a creative child, also an elite athlete, so I had a very non-traditional route even to law school. What sports did you participate in? A tennis scholarship at Northwestern, and then I played professionally for four years after graduating from Northwestern and before going to law school. And most of it was satellite and challenger circuit events around the world to earn enough points to actually get into the majors. 93 was my best year. I got into the qualifying rounds of the U.S. Open. And that week actually earned more money in one week than I did usually. <laughs> so it's it's kind of a grind to get from place to place. But that was a wonderful part. I really have had a lot of jobs when I say it out loud. <laughs> yeah. but, do you still play tennis? I do. I'm still going to always be better than most, but it hurts like hell the next day. <laughs> but I love it. It's interesting being an aging jock and the mind tells you to do things that you know that you could have done 20 or 30 it's years instinct, ago. right? You know. Yeah. So I've, you know, I've had a full rupture of an Achilles. I had a hip issue with a debridement. So I have a new relationship with tennis, but I love it. And it is truly one of the few sports of a lifetime if you keep your body together. <laughs> What's your take on pickleball? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> lean in. I mean, we tennis players kind of frown on this pickleball yeah. situation, but yeah. it seems fun. I've not yeah. played it, and I kind of turned my nose up at it at first. Uh, don't at me. I, I understand. One of my best friends <laughs> plays. She's very good, so she's trying to get me on the pickleball court. Pre-tennis, were you thinking about law? Or was this after tennis, you say, hey, I'm going to go to law school? I was thinking about it. And I, in fact, I had taken the LSAT because I was slightly injured my last year in 91 at Northwestern. And so my future for professional tennis, even though so many of us, we had a great team. So many of us went on to play at least some professional tennis before moving on. So it was always in the cards. But I took the LSAT, did fine. But I had a conversation with my parents to say, 
You didn't pay for undergrad. I really want to see where this is going to go. So give me a few years and let me figure this out. And uh, my mother said, absolutely, baby, anything. My father said, oh, dear God, she's gone crazy again. (laughs) But (laughs) we met in the middle. I did go on to have a fantastic career. I saw the world. I think I have always been intellectually curious with and a critical thinker. I've always been a problem solver and kind of a tinkerer. And those skills translate well, obviously, not only to my clerkship in the Third Circuit for Judge McKee, starting at Big Law at Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath at the time. They've changed their name since uh, back in the day. Uh, And also Pepper Hamilton, that has also changed his name since then. But I started in Big Law, actually, in the Trust and Estates Department, doing nothing related, little related to what I'm doing now. But it's been an interesting ride. Why do you make the switch to teaching? I was the type of student that loved law school. And again, you know, this lifelong learner, kind of, uh, some of my best friends and colleagues to this day are some of my professors from Howard Law School. I love to write. I love quiet. <laughs> I love, <you> know, <laughs> to be able to think and to think normatively about what should be. And I love to see the transformation that students take from coming in super green, one L's, and so often we focus a lot on teaching them to be a law student in that first year. Those second and third year courses, they really start to blossom into the legal practitioner mind, which is what I really, really enjoy. Just that evolution. And so I'm very drawn to academia. And I think it gives a good, particularly in the lane, I know we'll speak about it in a moment, The idea of being an academic that doesn't really have a dog in the fight to say all crypto all the time or no crypto any of the time. And so having an academic approach to that really opens up the possibility for conversation. I enjoyed that that part very much as well. So you say you're intellectually curious. I think that might be an understatement because you're very busy. You got your own podcast, Tech Intersect. Yes. You also started the Advantage Evans Academy, which as I understand it, it's learning. It's, It's a place you can go to learn about. The new economy, digital economy, right? Absolutely. When I thought about the work that I was doing in law schools, and before Penn State Dickinson Law, I was an associate dean for academic affairs at Franklin Pierce Law School up in New Hampshire. That's where I really started to develop myself as transitioning from a pure intellectual property lawyer and law professor into the intersection of intellectual property and new technologies. That was my, my entry point. And the thinking about how important it is to remain relevant and ahead of the curve is always critically important. The idea of focusing on what the next thing is so that we can be conversant in that space is really, really important as well. And building a practice that is ready and nimble and flexible and responsive to where the world is moving, all of those things are are certainly critically important. And I didn't want to just do it in law school. I also wanted to offer those opportunities to folks who weren't going to go to law school. Even when I developed an online certificate program for professionals, it was in the confines of law school. And I just think education is so different now. There are many people like you and I, I wouldn't mind going and learning for the the, the exercise of learning. People don't have time for that. They don't have the money for that. And they don't have the interest in that. So a modular experience, whether or not you are in traditional education, became important to me. And so it was a natural transition to develop Advantage Evans Academy for the person who is a non-technologist. They are certainly maybe a professional. And I've kind of developed a curriculum specifically for professionals who are not in law school. But it was kind of a both and approach to me to have the best world of academia, but also the practical approach and access to folks who were on the ground and needed information quickly, succinctly packaged in a way that they could make immediately relevant to their particular discipline. I see as far back as 2019, you're right about crypto. And we're here to talk about the book, which I love, which I recommend. Digital Money Demystified. I just literally bought a copy for my buddy who's always asking questions about why I love Bitcoin so much. So I sent it to him, recommend it. But in the intro to the book, you see a risk averse. Yeah. So what got you into crypto? Because obviously, although we'll talk about crypto is, that's a myth you like to debunk it. It's less risky than people sure. think. But what was it? You know, you say go down the rabbit hole, but what led you there? I believed every single myth in the book, for sure. The, the idea 
just for criminals, fad, scam, all of the things, especially as someone who is tech adjacent, but also trained to be risk averse, trained right. to spot legal issues and to protect my clients from risk. And risk is like a major, major issue. But at the time I was at Franklin Pierce, we were interviewing someone who had just written an article really at the intersection of intellectual property and this technology with which I wasn't familiar, blockchain, decentralized something or other, magic internet money, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know what he was talking about, but because it mentioned substantively about the changes that were afoot in intellectual property in general, copyright and patent in particular, although there are many issues around uh, trademarks as well, jurisdictional questions, ways to... Um, learn from some of the the, the legal history and the, the development of the law around the internet and peer-to-peer -peer technologies, Napster, Grokster, BitTorrent, um, all of those things, I was immediately drawn to, hmm, how is this going to change the way that I approach teaching an intellectual property survey course, my copyright seminars? And I had just never been exposed to the idea of how intellectual property and open source software would necessarily change the way that the next iteration of the internet, we weren't even calling it Web3 at the time, right. but that next iteration of the internet, what that was going to look like. That was my entry point. And I didn't know what cryptographically secured assets or blockchain technology would mean for me personally as an investor or consumer, but I was very invested in making sure I was equipping um, my students uh, to be conversant in this area of the law, to understand the disruptive impact of innovation, the fact that it was moving at lightning speed, and I didn't want them to get left behind professionally. I wanted to give them an advantage to be really, it takes a little to be the smartest person in the room as you continue to learn and evolve. So it was my love of academia, my commitment to my students to prepare them that drew me in. And once that was on the radar, then I had to take a deep dive learn everything that I could learn. My mother was on this conversation with us. She would explain something like she was grading papers. She was home for Christmas. She might have been in the same pajamas. We don't know. But she came out of the room <laughs> like, oh, my God, this is going to change the world. About two weeks later, after going to YouTube University and listening to every podcast, um, reading blogs, there, there's so much more information now than there was right. then. But that was my my rabbit hole experience to get up to speed and to take a very deep dive at the intersection of intellectual property and this new technology, despite my aversion to risk. So I assume in your class, you have a module now where you talk to your IP class, we you talk about this, you talk about the the changes that are afoot. Absolutely. And not even just a module at this point, not only do I teach intellectual property disciplines, and I try to integrate the conversation throughout the semester, but even more importantly, because I also teach administrative law, information privacy law, and specifically blockchain, cryptocurrency, and law. I'm literally teaching that right now, an experiential format for outside guests to come in, discussion posts. is very rich in that way. And it's different every semester because this That's technology great. literally changes almost every day. And so right. it's an, a fun experience for me to cobble things together, to have my book to help them in the beginning demystify, but then to move over to specifically legal topics to explore what's going on legislatively in terms of regulations. Uh, certainly the judiciary is very active right now. So it's Thankfully just so. a wealth, uh, a kind of a, a treasure trove. Yeah, really, really, really fun. How many other law schools do you know of that are offering a class specifically blockchain, crypto, and the law? Not many. It's still in the single digits. Uh, I think more and more people, professors are, so many people are afraid. We're, yeah. we, we're, we're afraid of what we don't know. Lawyers are afraid and professors. And, and because those areas and disciplines tend to be conservative in terms of evolution and change, they necessarily lag in some respects, and that's a feature, not a bug. But we really just don't have the luxury of time. We're sending law students out into the world without having any touch to this. It's just, it's unconscionable at this point, yeah, quite yeah. frankly, because I feel that 
because there's a disruptive impact or some legal consequence in every industry and sector, whether you're talking about constitutional law, civ pro, crim pro, tort, you name it, right? There's so many areas that implicate this, but we don't have enough people who actually are conversant enough to actually right. teach it. And so that's kind of the gap. That's why I'm encouraging practitioners to really start to explore and learn. We need more adjuncts and, and also in-house professors to teach this. Now, I will say at the business school level, there are many. Right. And I think that's because the first um, use case was the disruption around financial technology and business. And so it was the natural place. I think ideally there should be some interaction between B schools and law schools that would be really fun to develop a curriculum that has the best of a joint JD MBA that would in right. incorporate this. I think the person who does that would be the strongest to and most prepared for the future. When we come back in just a couple minutes, Tanya digs into her new book, Digital Money Demystified, and she debunks a bunch of misconceptions about crypto. She also explains how digital money will help create a more inclusive and equitable finance industry. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Tech. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. Technically legal. We'll get back to my conversation with Professor Tanya Evans in just a second. But before we do, I want to direct you to tealpodcast.com. At that address, you can find an episode page for this episode and every episode we've done in the past, where there's more information about our guests and links to some of the stuff we talk about. If you want to get a hold of me, you can catch me on email at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. You can also find me on LinkedIn and X. Let's get back to my talk with Professor Tanya Evans. She's just about to debunk a lot of myths about cryptocurrency. You spent a good portion of your book debunking myths. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to go through all of them, but I want to touch on some that I think are the most prevalent. For instance, I love this one. You debunk the myth that crypto equals criminal behavior. It's only for criminals. And I didn't even know this, but this chain analysis research in 2020, it was less than like 0.34 of crypto transactions. Right. It's minuscule compared to all the transactions that happen on crypto on a daily basis. Absolutely. It's going to take a while because I think the headlines around a few sensational, horrible actors in the space at a time when there was a lot of attention and a lot of consumers and investor enthusiasm, it makes me think of, you know, Crypto.com having naming rights for stadiums right. and Tom Brady and Larry David and many celebrities were talking about it. We saw every commercial. The Super Bowl was focused. The price of Bitcoin was kissing 67000 per coin. There was a lot of interest and enthusiasm. And then you have the year of the crypto contagion with the likes of Sam Bankman Freed, proven to be one actor and having a few few actors in the space, and actually not even involving a crypto scam in the sense of how Which you is an might aptitude. I don't think even know it. if it was, I mean it was criminal probably or ultimately will super be, criminal. But, but mainly it was ineptitude. It's not like Silk Road. This was just ineptitude. It just doesn't help, to your point. This was also criminal, and he was found guilty. So uh, the ineptitude part, I imagine, is just like we have folks who are there, and they throw up a white paper and a website, and and they are finding, uh, you know, following the shiny object. It was more diabolical than that, for sure, because essentially, long story short, the FTX issue was... Sam Bankman Freed encouraging people to send their fiat or government issued currency or coins and tokens, leave them on the FTX exchange. And it's not a bank, it's an exchange. It's intended for you right. to have assets on platform. You have makers, you have takers, you have, you, you know, you have these um, trading pairs, just like if you were trading stocks. And then when you're done, to take your assets off of the centralized exchange unbeknownst to people who were enticed to leave them on platform in exchange for earning interest or um, or a yield anywhere from 8 9%. Not insignificant given right. what we get in a, in a regular checking account or savings account. Unbeknownst to those depositors, he was 
rerouting those assets to his sister company, which was a hedge fund that he also owned, Alameda Research, and making speculative investments. Hoping It's a classic Ponzi scheme, really. Right. It's a house of cards. It falls down. From the time that he was identified and charged while he was in the Bahamas, it took one year to come to full judgment. It took longer to get Bernie Madoff. It took longer to deal with Lehman Brothers. You know, this is a classic garden variety Ponzi scheme using a particular asset, but it wasn't crypto that was illegal or somehow a scam. It was a scammer. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But that's the black eye for the industry. It couldn't have come at a worse time. Then you have macroeconomics going on. You have the pandemic. You have a lot of assets dropping in value, but it's too easy. And I think intellectually lazy for people to focus on and say, oh, all scam. Don't need to know. Nothing to see here. That two things can be true. We hold people to account because we want clear rules of the road. I'm not an advocate for no rules or anarchy. And and most of the colleagues, all of the colleagues that I know say the same thing. But to throw the baby out with the bathwater, for lack of a better way to describe, we do an injustice to the import of this technology and the fact that around the world, other countries seem to be doing just fine. There's a real risk the United States can lose the, the lead here. But Absolutely. To your point there, there's another myth you debunk that although the United States is behind in this, crypto is not unregulated. It is a little wild, wild west, but it is not unregulated. Right. That's an important point, and that I took great pride in that particular chapter to lay out the foundation. I mean, we just gave an example of how both laws and rules and regulations caught up to someone who was a bad actor and broke laws violated rules, regulations, norms, all of those things. We have those things in place and they function very well. The gray area when you think about the regulation of financial markets really comes between uh, the Securities Exchange Commission and the CFTC, Commodities Future Trading Commission, and how the CFTC is focused on commodities, you you know, grain, wheat, uh, gold, things of that nature, and also crypto that is not deemed to be a security. And then we have a pretty aggressive SEC led by Gary Gensler, who is kind of deeming every token out there except for Bitcoin. And now uh, reluctantly Ethereum to hear him tell it. Everything else is a is a security. And we'll just take that all here, the SEC. And that's not necessarily so. It's actually a legal conclusion to determine whether some type of asset or maybe some type of trading platform is actually trading in securities. It's a legal conclusion that in the absence of Congress being more definitive, we're left to independent agencies to use their existing enabling legislation and their existing power to regulate until Congress acts. And then we have the challenges that we see because, you know, the judicial branch is quite frothy now because we're left to litigate these case by case, regulated party by regulated party, unless there are rules that need to be updated as a matter of of securities. Now, we're talking about laws from the 40s. Yeah, it does need to be updated. There's no question. It's just too old. The how it test is just too old. You know, another myth you debunk too is, and I, I want you to expand on this so people understand it is, and it played into FTX a little bit there, crypto is not anonymous transactions. In fact, it's transparent and traceable. Now, you, you got to know who owns a particular, is at the one end, the true identity of it, you, you need to know that, but it's traceable. And you can see every transaction on a blockchain. Absolutely. And it's funny that you mention it now because recently in class, we covered, we have a whole module on blockchain forensics. And the students are as fascinated as I was when I started looking under the hood. Now, this idea about, Crypto being anonymous, it's actually pseudonymous. You're identified by wallet, but not personally identifiable information or PPI. Although when you onboard with a centralized exchange that is following know your customer anti-money laundering rules, there's a certain amount of personally identifiable information collected at that onboarding point, right? That is an opportunity for people not only to attach that information if they were subpoenaed, for example, but also by your wallet address. So it's kind of, you might loosely think of it as, you know, an IP address for right. for a computer. There is a way, there is a, a digital thumbprint, as it were. So it's not pseudonymous. 
the caveat is there are some privacy coins. So Zcash, Monero. Which just got delisted from Binance, right? Just or got something. delisted. Yeah. <laughs> and the price plummets as a result, yeah. right? That has always been problematic because of this, the mindset that says if you are secretive about your financial transactions, that translates into illegality. Which it does not. Like maybe you want Which to donate money. Not. You want to donate money anonymously. You truly can here. Absolutely. And under a certain amount of money, right? Or if I gave you $9,000 in a bag or 9999 right. <laughs> right? I give you $10. That's between you and me. Right. I want a world where we have the type of financial privacy that we do with physical cash, but with the convenience um, the ease, time to settlement, de-risking um, a transaction that you find in digital form. And that was the whole purpose behind peer-to-peer -peer cash articulated in, in the uh, Satoshi white paper in 2008 before Bitcoin first launched in January of 2009. Physical cash. So glad you brought that up because this <laughs> is another myth you debunk that – so we'll go to the easy one. They, they say blockchain is a lot of energy. They especially pick on Bitcoin. The miners use a lot of the energy. They do. They absolutely do. But as an aside here, they're on the forefront of using alternative energy, using energy that's not being absolutely. used. Absolutely. Going back to this physical cash, I didn't know this. I was watching a PBS show. I watched it recently, but it was 10 years old, and I didn't know this. Some banks, because they cannot store cash, especially in big cities, they have to truck it out every single day to the Federal Reserve to wow. hold on to it. So. And think about there's bank branches in, you know, I would assume you that correct. traditional <laughs> finance with brick and mortar uses more energy. Absolutely. And comparing apples to apples, you know, when I think about the environmental impact and my bet on the crypto uh, industry to move to cleaner resources faster than our legacy financial system, if you're going to compare the crypto economy, which is global, then we need to focus on the global legacy financial system. And it pales in comparison. Just Wall Street alone <laughs> or the trucking and oh, the yeah. carbon emissions. You can't take all of Bitcoin, for example, based upon its proof of work. That's the reason that it, there's this expenditure of electricity, et cetera, and compare a global system to a country. If you're going to compare Bitcoin and the impact to the environment, compare it to the legacy financial system. And also think as a matter, you know, I think from a professorial point of view and from a, a legal point of view, the idea of the lesser of the harms, we do a harm benefit analysis constantly. It makes me think of when I was teaching uh, first year property and, and we're talking about nuisance laws and here is the harm, but then on par with the benefit, is it is the harm greater or is the benefit greater? Right. So there's a lot of work that we need to do to right-size the conversation so that we're all working toward a more effective and efficient system that has as little impact, you know, carbon neutral as possible. And there's so many projects that actually live up to that, not the least of which was when Ethereum, the Ethereum network switched from proof of work to proof of stake. We explain the distinction there because I don't think a lot of people know the difference between proof of work and proof of stake. Absolutely. So proof of work essentially is a gaming mechanism to create a verification and security of the network. Let's focus on Bitcoin, for example, the first blockchain and the first one, of course, to use proof of work. Every 10 minutes or so, there are a series of transactions that are validated and verified and kind of distilled, or we would call it hashed into a single alphanumeric chain, not to get too wonky. And when that information is distilled, there are also computers that are devoted to securing the network and verifying and establishing those blocks every 10 minutes since the beginning of Bitcoin. In order to do that, there is computational power that's used for one single computer in the process of validation and verification to actually solve um, an equation. In order to do that, it's like your computational power is used to guess this specific number. I'm reducing it down to the bare essence of it. The computer that's successful actually is awarded Bitcoin, but the process of that has gotten really, really, really challenging over the years. It used to be... You need special computers with absolutely. really powerful GPUs. 
those ASIC miners, you have one semiconductor chip that is devoted to that specific action, right? But you used to be able to do it literally on a right. laptop, not possible at this point. An extraordinary amount of energy is used to devote a particular type of computer to that process. And that's the computational power. And that takes a lot of power, energy, money. So that theory moved to proof of stake. How's that different? There's still computation involved. Right. And it focuses more on the amount of assets that are devoted to the blockchain. So in, instead of devoting computational power, you're devoting a particular stake in a particular network. And that's very, very different. It doesn't involve any of the environmental or electrical issues of proof of work because there's a different way of achieving consensus on a blockchain. And there are many other ways. You have proof of work, proof of stake, you have delegated proof of stake. There are all these different ways, and many of them are very environmentally conscious and friendly. Before I leave the energy myth, I wonder if you want to do a study with me. I've been wanting to do this. Here's a study. I would like to know how much energy is spent just in America. We'll just stick with America on holiday lights. <laughs> I would really <laughs> like to know and compare that to what's spent on Bitcoin. Me too, especially because I have one string still up, so I'm guilty as charged. I hope it's not plugged in. So. <laughs> okay, so switching gears a little bit. Not too long ago, you were in front of the House Finance Committee uh, at a hearing. Basically, it was on the federal government's general hostility towards crypto was, I think, the, the point of it. But one of the things you brought up is another positive of cryptocurrency is it provides opportunity to those who've been disenfranchised from our traditional banking system. Why is that? Why can cryptocurrency make it easier for those who might not be able to go down to their corner bank and get a loan, but they can, you know, crypto will help them achieve what they want to achieve financially? When I think about how generational wealth is created, it is almost never created just with a high income especially because income is taxed at a higher rate than capital assets. And that's why extremely wealthy people say, please just pay me $1 in income, but give me $10 million in stock. I'll be the South of France if you need me, <laughs> right? Because they know, one, capital assets are taxed at a lower rate. There are many advantages. You will not only enjoy the capital appreciation, but you can also short things, you know, short stocks and, and benefit in uptimes and down. That's the true sign of wealth is asset accumulation that has a return on investment. Now, let's think about the opportunities to do that investment in a home. Good luck getting a loan right now. But, you know, the American dream, home, also retirement funds. We don't really have, I don't know many people who have a pension right now, but we focus on 401ks, 403bs, SEP, salaries, blah, 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 right? If you don't have the type of career or a job that gives you that type of access, at least to a retirement account. And so now imagine the opportunity to have access to crypto assets taxed in the United States as a capital asset. So it appreciates, not only does it have its own value, but subject to appreciation and depreciation. And not having a gatekeeper say, you can participate. This is the beauty of a public and permissionless means of accessing this type of wealth accumulation potential, of course, right? Far more volatile and having more risk than traditional, more established markets, but still a relevant player. And there have been a lot of, relatively speaking, overnight successes that have gone from thousandaires to millionaires in a few short days or a few short years. The idea that there is no gatekeeper that can redline you out of participation in purchasing a house or no hiring partner that decides yay or nay or what type of benefits you can enjoy with a job. You know, not just going from hourly work to maybe um, a salaried employee. That has a lot of gatekeepers that we know systemically have impeded progress in that way. It also makes me think of the wealth gap between uh, Black Americans and white Americans, as well as Latinos and others. And it is stark and doesn't have anything to do, generally speaking, with the amount of education, where you live. So there's some other systemic issues that aren't present in a system that as long as you have a wallet, you don't have to rely on people. You don't have to trust people. You trust in the protocol. You trust in the software 
that is managing the system. Oftentimes in the crypto space, we talk about honoring rules, not rulers, right? It's kind of a, a biting way to describe this idea, particularly in an environment now, and it certainly was the case back in 2008, 2009, in a lack of trust, lack of trust in government, lack of trust in institutions that yeah. can't even agree on basic facts at this point. And there's just a lot going on, a lot going on. <laughs> Uh, but the one thing, evidently, people are willing to hang their hat on is a, a public-facing ledger of every single transaction and every transactional piece of data that came before it, where you can identify by wallet, but again, as we said earlier, not necessarily unless someone is doxxed by personally identifiable information. That's a lot of power. It is the democratization, little d, of access and inclusion which is interesting because no small part of the pushback from traditional finance and government is that, is their fear that. But it's tr it is truly, That's correct. It, Absolutely. it is democratization. It's interesting. And, you know, being in front of Congress and having that conversation, that was uh, before the, the House Financial Services Subcommittee on Digital Assets, Financial Technology and Inclusion. We didn't spend enough time on inclusion, but I certainly have it in my written remarks. But to your point, I think this is, Something particularly on the Democratic side of the aisle that is missed because there is a lot of skepticism that was heightened by the crypto contagion that we talked about for Dems who are consumer and investor focused and highly critical because all they can see is the sensational headline, but not the use case that empowers folks who right. are underbanked and unbanked particularly coming out of predatory lending and all the other things that still cause major concerns and major problems for people to advance and close, narrow the wealth gap. So use case, you just talked about certain use cases for crypto and blockchain. As we close this out, I want to bring it back because obviously this is a legal facing podcast. The use cases, which I think are being overlooked by legal in general, just like the rest of the population. But at some point, when more and more people start to buy into blockchain technology and crypto, it's going to hit legal first because it impacts what it means to have a legal right to something. What can we do to kind of impress upon attorneys, take it more seriously, that it's not bad actors and flash in the pan, fat? Like, what can we do? First of all, we need some new lawyers, and I'm working on that at the law school. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age as well, and so I've had enough experience behind me to know how important it is to always remain ready and able and to leverage the existing problem solving and issue spotting skills, the advocacy skills to help this ecosystem define the rules of the road, the rules of engagement that we will have for this next iteration of the internet. This is not about the future is now. The future was literally yesterday. I also talk as a matter of ethics what it means to be competent to practice law. It includes technological competence, not just about turning on your computer yeah. and yeah. is this thing on, right, for Zooms, but about remaining up to date on the technological changes impacting your particular discipline. It's the reason I fell down my own rabbit hole at the intersection of intellectual property and blockchain. I was like, I don't know about the rest of this stuff, but I need to keep up in a relatively short period of time, kind of probably about six weeks to two months after I fell down my rabbit hole, I was retained to go halfway around the world to Bangkok in order to train lawyers there who were intellectual property lawyers. That led to me going to the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, doing the same thing for hundreds of staff and lawyers there because around the world, people are focused on this. They are building their practices around this. That was in 2018 when I did that work. So think of where we are now in 2024 and how much things have changed. Right. In the legal community, do you think that we're any, even, any more evolved or taking it any more seriously than it was in 2018? If we're just paying attention to the headline, we are not going to be ready to answer the phone for the client that says, what do I need to know about this? That's coming. Especially in IP. Absolutely. Don't you agree that IP is going to be the first one, I think, that comes out and, and blockchain is, that takes over, but it, it's going to be the area where it's adopted. Right. Earliest. We have all the new questions, but we still have an old Copyright Act from 1976, right. even though it's had updates uh, over time, it's still the bones, the guts of it really is from 76, right? 
Um, certainly from a financial perspective, when you think of uh, regulatory attorneys, when you think of folks who are dealing with mergers and acquisitions, when you think of wills, trusts, and estates, how do you plan for this other yeah. type of property, right, during and maximizing that planning during lifetime and the succession of wealth at death and in, in trusts. It makes me think of the estate planning that I used to do to have a special designated trustee for a special trust for intellectual property assets because we came into the same issue where mom and pop, you know, they had the house and the car and that's fine, but they also had this patent as well. And nobody, you know, that trusted family person who we wanted to be trustee doesn't know what the hell they're talking about with respect to IP. So we're going to have to designate a special trustee. I imagine a world for estate planners and estate administration in that realm as well. This is touching everything. We do not have the luxury of time to do the head in the sand thing. Uh, what we don't know absolutely not only will hurt our clients, but also will quickly go into irrelevance. It makes me think of of Blockbuster and Netflix, <laughs> right? Do you want to be Blockbuster or do you want to be Netflix? Well, and you know, AI is going to contribute to that too, right? Absolutely. Professor Evans, I really appreciate your time. If people want to find you or find your book, where do you want to send them? And which, by the way, I'll add links to all this, the commercial testimony, an Amazon link to the book, links to you to get all to you in the show notes. But where do you want to send them if they're just listening? Well, the first place to go is AdvantageEvans.com. You can learn more about the book there. Or you can learn about Advantage Evans Academy if you want training, if you want corporate consulting. The, that would be your first place to go. If you want to focus specifically on the book, go to digitalmoneydemystified.com or whatever link is in the show notes as well. But digitalmoneydemystified.com is a place that in addition to learning more about the book and various topics, also have a membership program as well on the investor side, but also on the professional side. And I'm really excited about that work because it's doing precisely, Chad, what you've been talking about. How do professionals get up to speed quickly? And it's in an environment like that with the best and brightest, some of my other colleagues coming in to talk about the legal issues that matter most to professionals. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.